Hello, and welcome to Stars, Cells, and God, the show where we discuss new discoveries taking place at the frontiers of science that have theological and philosophical implications, as well as new discoveries that point to the reality of God's existence. My name is Hugh Ross. I'm joined today by our president, Buzz Rana, and today I'll be your guide as we explore the topic of uh, Neanderthals and the burial of dead. And I'm going to be talking about a brand new discovery from the James Webb Space Telescope on the chemistry of the earliest stars and galaxies in the universe. But before we get into these discussions, I wanted to encourage you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, Reasons to Believe YouTube, and click on the bell icon so you can be informed of our new videos. Learn more at reasons.org or by following us on social media at RTB underscore official. Oh, Fuzz, I read the paper you were talking about. It's an exciting discovery. So yep. let's let's dive into it. Yeah, well, and, and to, to have a little bit of fun before we we, we plow into it, um, you know, there are things that we think happened in history that actually didn't happen, right? And uh, to, to celebrate that fact, a few years ago, Reader's Digest had a piece published where they claim that there are nine famous events in history that never happened. Now, I've not done independent corroboration to, to determine whether or not uh, Reader's Digest is correct about this, uh, but it's just kind of fun to look at the list. You know, that Nero didn't fiddle while Rome burned, rats didn't spread the Black Death, the Nina, Penta, and Santa Marina were not the names of Columbus's ships. This is one that might get some people worked up in our audience. Martin Luther didn't nail 95 theses on the church door. That may actually be an apocryphal story, according to the Reader's Digest. So uh, anyway, uh, Newton didn't have an apple fall on his head. Witches weren't burned at the stake in Salem. Ben Franklin didn't discover electricity. I knew that. Uh, Marie Antoinette didn't say, let them eat cake. And Van Gogh didn't cut off his ear. Now, uh, I'm not saying that this, the, the well, readers. I know that most of these indeed are correct. <laughs> uh, again, I'm wondering, well, what, what did Martin Luther do? Well, was it, was and, it? and I don't remember <laughs> the, the write-up. Uh, I, I, he did obviously protest uh, against the Catholic Church. But and there were 95 theses, but exactly. He may not have actually gone and pounded them into the into a door. Maybe it was a door jam or some other place. I don't yeah, yeah, know. Yeah, well, anyway, but I'm not really here to defend or, you know, Reader's Digest. But, but it's the point is really that there are these stories that become part of our culture that we think are historical. And but they're just apocryphal. They're not. Yeah. Well, there's actually a story that is part of prehistory that is really apocryphal too, based on some recent scientific work. And this is the idea that Neanderthal buried their dead ritualistically by laying them on a bed of flowers, right? This is, a, a, a I think, a, a painting that's uh, been done by the Smithsonian, kind of depicting a Neanderthal burial. Oh, I see something else apocryphal here. They're wearing sophisticated clothing. <laughs> yeah. And we know that wasn't the case. <laughs> yeah. Well, but but th that's a great point, Hugh, because th there is a, a pretty pervasive narrative that Neanderthals were just like us. Right. That there's nothing really special about humans, that we may consider ourselves exceptional, but Neanderthals were exceptional too. If you put a suit on them and have them walk in Manhattan, right. it would blend right in. Right. And <laughs> and for an anthropologist, the idea of a ritualistic burial is really significant because it means that, number one, um, that that there is a sense of mortality that we that we would have. That that whoever is able to bury their dead ritualistically has an awareness of their the, of the temporality of their existence burial particularly if it's ritualistic also connotes an understanding of an afterlife that individual's going to persist in their existence they're just moving to a different plane of reality so it's a picture of a very complex world there, where there's a physical and an immaterial aspect to the to reality and that the the grave goods are are included with the idea that those goods might be very well things that w that person would need in the life to come, 
right? And, and that funerary practices oftentimes are considered to be critical in that transition from this realm to the next realm. Uh, and so the idea is that if you are engaged in these kinds of ritualistic behavior, it's not only, you know, connoting some pretty sophisticated cognitive abilities and a, a sophisticated understanding of the world and, 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 you know, individuals, the capacity and the makeup of individuals, but it also con connotes empathy that the, the community is coming together uh, uh, to support those people that lost a loved one, to, to memorialize that, that individual. There's respect and, and, and love and, and dignity afforded that person that's been lost. So the idea of an intentional ritualistic burial that's part of a funerary practice is really connoting pretty sophisticated uh, cognitive abilities. And so if Neanderthals are doing this, then that means they must be and very this much claim like has it. been around a long time. Yep. I mean, way before Reasons to Believe got launched, this was in the scientific literature. Yep. I think it goes back to when you were still a young boy, Fuzz. Maybe so. even be before I was even a young boy. In <laughs> fact, the, the um, this claim is based on some evidence, uh, but it's not robust evidence. And and it turns out that an anthropologist by the name of Ralph Selecki uh, in the 1950s uh, for about a decade, uh, was doing excavations at a, a a site that's now known as the Shanadar site. That's a very famous site. Yes, yeah, yeah it's a ne famous Neanderthal site uh, that is in um, the northern part of Iraq. In the, I guess, the Zagros Mountains. I think is the. It is. It's also famous for early human uh, relics. So okay, you got both Neanderthals and humans. Mm -hmm. Using that cave. Yeah. Well, here's a just showing where the Shanadar cave site is. And this is a picture of the Shanadar cave. Well, uh, at that site, uh, there was a, an excavation that, again, Ralph Selecki was involved in. And he returned several times over the course of a decade to complete the excavation. But it's a, a series of layers in which there are Neanderthals buried kind of consecutively. Uh, uh, that they unearth again over the span of 10 years. And one of the layers is called the Shanadar four layer. And it's depicting a Neanderthal w with a fairly complete skeletal, skeletal remains in a, a fetal position that looks like it's been deliberately placed in that position. So it looks like an intentional burial. And at that time, Selecki, uh, collected soil samples. Some of those samples were at the same layer, inter, kind of interdigitated with the the ribs and and kind of co contempt co contemporary with the Neanderthal specimen. And then he also took soil samples from beneath the Neanderthal specimen, and then sent them off to someone who was one of the world's experts at that time, looking at pollen. And they were able to determine that the pollen appeared to be ancient because of the certain morphological features. And they identified six or seven different plants that this pollen came from. And so on that basis, Selecki argued, well, it looks like there was this bed of flowers that were laid out that this the, the, that the Neanderthal was placed upon as part of a, a ritualistic burial. So that means burial. they were able to identify the uh, pollen species? Yes. They were. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and that, you know, people that are experts in in pollen analysis can can do that uh, quite. Usually it's it may not be the specific species, but it's going to be the, the, the genus or the family. That, but they that, knew that these were beautiful flowering plants yes, to some degree. Yes. Yeah. Now, you know, as uh, the author of a paper that I'm going to talk about, Chris Hunt, points out in the introduction of the paper, look, this story um, was a really nice story that had a little bit of evidential support, but the evidence wasn't robust. And and so people cha have challenged that interpretation of Selecki at the time and have continued to challenge that interpretation. Oh, you have in your writings. I've seen that. Yeah. So. Well, and, and people have suggested, well, maybe... Uh, that there maybe there were rats or rodents that were burrowing into that grave site and depositing pollen, or maybe bees were delivering pollen to the to the site. Or the wind could be dropping the pollen. Right. Yeah, so. You know, and and so 
transferring pollen is not a hard thing to do. In fact, there are some people who even thought, well, maybe the crew that was working on the excavation got pollen on their boots, on their clothes, and were actually depositing the pollen in the soil samples during the excavation process. Now, that explanation is ruled out because the pollen does have the morphology of indicating that it was ancient. Ancient, right. So that rules that out. Uh, now, this uh, paper that I'm going to talk about, uh, again, it was written by Christopher Hunt and, and a team of collaborators. He is le leading a team that's returned to Shanadar, who's found another Neanderthal site that's called Shanadar Z. And they're doing the excavations on that. But because they've gone back several times at different times of the year, they now have become aware of the types of wildflowers that are in that area. Uh, they were aware of when they bloom and things like that. And they began to become suspicious about whether or not this flower burial explanation was really credible. So they launched a scientific study where they were reassessing really the original claims in light of the excavations that they were doing and, and their familiarity with the, the, the landscape. And the first thing they point out is that, look, one of the flowers that they've discovered pollen at in the Neanderthal grave is this particular specimen. Uh, and it noticed the really big spikes <laughs> associated with the flower. Right. It's like nobody's going to actually pick that. It's, let like alone, a, it's like a thistle, right? <laughs> right. Let alone pick it as, as something that you're going to lay a loved one on top of as part of a ritualistic burial. So, and they also... So you've never given thistles to your wife on <laughs> Valentine's Day? No, no I haven't. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I don't I don't know much about that department, but I know that's not a good idea. It's not a good idea. <laughs> Even I know that's not a good idea. <laughs> but, but another thing they noticed too is that a number of the different types of flowers that they detected pollen for don't actually bloom at the same time. And so they were aware of that because they were in that location time and time again. And so you're not going to be picking, you, you're not, you, there's no way you could pick all the different species of plants uh, for a burial that would be flowering at the same time. So this can't be a flower burial is, yeah. is their point. Yeah, that was a very strong point they made in their paper. Right. Yeah. Something else they noted, too, is that many, the clumps of pollen that were discovered in the soil samples, in many instances, were made up of pollen coming from several different plant species, not a single plant species, which is what you would expect. Uh, and so when you put that all together, it's like, look, this can't be a flower burial. So what's the explanation? And at doing, during their excavations, they noticed that there were bees, ice, single bees that would burrow into the, into the dirt, creating a nest. And so they would go and gather pollen and then bring it to the, you know, to their nest that they burrowed into the, into the ground. This is, would explain why you've got pollen from different plants all together in a single clump. And then when they began to ex excavate the Shandadar Z site, they noticed basically fossilized burrow holes from bees uh, that likely are delivering pollen contemporaneously with uh, the Neanderthal burial. And in fact, they even isolated this uh, a, a, a fossilized burrow hole uh, from, from the site. So their, their conclusion is most likely the source are these burrowing these bees, bees yeah. that are delivering, you know, the pollen to the to the site. And bees are loaded with pollen. Yes. And again, from all different and, kinds And they're of going plants. out, returning, uh, collecting it and returning, collecting it and returning. So bottom line is that this idea of a ritualistic flower burial just simply is, is not sustain, sustainable. The evidence really doesn't support that. Now, something that Chris Hunt does suggest which is interesting is that there still could have been that that the Shanadar site, the the one that Selecki was excavating and the one that he is, very well may reflect intentional burials because these sites are uh, juxtaposed to geological features that seem to be prominent. That could be, and the fact that the there are specimens that are kind of 
on top of each other suggests that this was a site for a deliberate burial. Uh, but it doesn't necessarily mean there was meaning associated right. with it. You know, with Neanderthals, there are some burials that qu are questionable if they're intentional burials. Cavitations in the fl cave floor where the body just could have potentially fallen into. The grave goods could re be involved mixing of layers. Uh, so it's not really clear if Neanderthals were intentionally burying their dead or not, though there's some claims that they were. But even if they were, just because it's an intentional burial doesn't mean it has meaning. Or doesn't mean that it's spiritual. It could be just emotional. Right. Like what happens when a matriarch elephant dies. Right. The remaining elephants in the herd will bury the, uh, right. the matriarch. And it's an expression of grief. Right. It's their emotions being poured out. Right. And we see that all across uh, with birds and mammals. Right. They do go through mourning uh, right. when a close associate of theirs Right. or a mate uh, actually dies. Right. So anyway, you know, the bottom line is there really isn't evidence that Neanderthals buried their dead ritualistically, that they engaged in funerary practices. You know, Now, something else that I'm going to bring up, which seems a little bit kind of like a dig at uh, anthropologists, but I think it's important to acknowledge this, is that a lot of times in anthropology, particularly when it comes to claims about Neanderthals, there are non-scientific factors that influence how the results are interpreted. I mean, you, you, you know, archaeologists and anthropologists are dealing with scant evidence, you know, and they're trying to construct hypotheses and scenarios based on that evidence. But this is a situation where the theory far or is is greatly underdetermined by the data, where the same data could support multiple narratives, multiple explanations. Um, and if you are of the mindset that Neanderthals are exceptional like us, you're going to interpret that data in a particular way. Uh, and, and this seems to be, you know, very prominent among anthropologists, much more so than any other area of science. But just to prove that point, here are three statements, two made by Chris Hunt, one by a guy named Paul Pettit, who's an anthropologist, about the Neanderthal <laughs> flower burial story. And so Chris Hunt says, although the evidence was subsequently questioned, the story was spectacular enough that it, still found, it was still found in most archaeology textbooks. So these are gra advanced undergraduate, graduate-level textbooks mm -hmm. that are telling the story of a flower burial because it's such a great story, not because the evidence actually, actually supports that. And then he says, it's really sad that we de demolish the flower burial story because it's a lovely story, right? This is showing the influence of non-scientific factors in terms of interpreting the, but you got to admire Chris Hunt for actually admitting that it is. It, oh, yes, yeah. exactly. Or, or Paul Pettit, another anthropologist who wasn't involved in the work but is commenting on it. He said, the original sampling for pollen was by no means exhaustive. So the, the flower burial myth was never based on robust evidence. It says more about the social background of the 1960s and the desire to humanize Neanderthals. You know, so the, the bottom line is that, um, again, there's not evidence that Neanderthals intentionally buried their dead. In any ritualistic way. And, and, and maybe even, yeah, it, let alone ritualistically. I'm not even convinced that the burials are intentional. Right. It could be, but I'm not convinced. But the, the bottom line for, for, for those of us who uh, hold to a Christian perspective on humanity and take the view that humans are exceptional... Uh, any kind of claim that we are not exceptional, that Neanderthals are like us, really challenges the notion of human exceptionalism and with it, this idea of the image of God. But the bottom line is that when it comes to Neanderthals, even though it's very popular to see Neanderthals like us, the evidence doesn't support that. The claim that, that they had language isn't substantiated by the evidence. The claims that they made art, they made jewelry, these are excuse me, or unsubstantiated claims uh, that, you know, are based on a, I think, a wishful interpretation of 
very limited archaeological evidence. Well, I don't know about you, Fuzz. I'm older than you are, but I can remember when I was in public school, junior high and high school, and uh, we were taught uh, that this evidence of Neanderthals burying their dead uh, was proof that they're just like us. Mm. It was very popular in the 50s and early 60s that Neanderthals are anatomically and behaviorally identical to us. And even since the 1950s, this has been trumped up as one of the primary evidences uh, that Neanderthals Mm -hmm. indeed were spiritually active to the same degree we are. And uh, I thank you for basically pointing out there's no basis uh, for that claim. And hopefully that'll cause anthropologists to begin to look a little more skeptically at other claims. Yeah. You know, about the spears they were manufacturing, the weaving that they were capable of. Right. Because to me, those are other examples where scant evidence and, you know, making these incredible uh, conclusions in a way that, in my opinion, is not substantiated. Yeah. So yeah. anyway, I'm, I'm looking forward to the article you're going to write on this. Yeah. This will be great. Yeah. Okay. Well, let me shift gears away from anthropology and Neanderthals to something that happened many billions of years ago, uh, which is what the James Webb Space Telescope has been revealing to us about the first galaxies in the universe. Mm. And uh, this has been one of the primary missions of the James Webb Space Telescope because these galaxies are so very far away and because they're smaller and not as bright as galaxies we see today, it's a real challenge uh, to get reliable information about the nature of the first stars and the first galaxies. Uh, But James Webb has now been actively uh, pursuing that part of the universe for a year and a half. Mm. And people, I think, have been impatient saying, why aren't they giving us the results we want right away? This is a 10-year project. And I'm amazed at how much the James Webb has achieved in just 18 months. Mm. But I think we need to tell everybody Uh, the real answers are going to take longer. It's going to take a lot more observational effort uh, to get the answers at the level of reliability and accuracy that astronomers desire. But one that got published literally just days ago uh, was a group of astronomers who looked at galaxies uh, that formed. They were basically looking at galaxies 600 million years after the Big Bang creation event. Okay. So we're looking, you know, 13.2 billion light years away and seeing these newly formed galaxies. And uh, they were able to use a James Webb Space Telescope. They had enough observing time. They could get some accurate spectral measurements. So they're actually able to determine the chemistry of these uh, very uh, early galaxies, these first formed galaxies. And we're rather surprised that what came back is that these galaxies have an abundance of heavy elements that's much less uh, than what have been anticipated uh, from most of the Big Bang creation models that are out there. Mm. And kind of the core of Big Bang cosmology is that the Big Bang, in the first few minutes after the cosmic creation event, uh, fuses about one quarter of the primordial hydrogen into Mm. helium. And so the universe begins with about 74% hydrogen, Mm -hmm. uh, begins with about 24 to 25% helium, and a trace amount of lithium. So the first stars form out of just three elements, hydrogen and helium and a trace amount of lithium. But the bigger of those stars will take that hydrogen and helium and their nuclear furnaces, they'll make carbon, oxygen, nitrogen, and other heavier than helium mm. elements. And these big stars uh, will end their nuclear burning with a supernova explosion. And when that happens, they blast or scatter the elements from their nuclear furnaces into interstellar space. And so the interstellar gas of hydrogen and helium gets polluted with the ashes from the nuclear burning of the first really big stars. And so you get a second generation of stars, stars that form from this polluted gas. And because they have now not just hydrogen and helium, uh, but heavy elements that they got from the ashes of the first born stars, when they ignite nuclear burning, the nuclear fusion is much more efficient Mm. in producing elements 
heavier than helium. And so when they go supernova, they blast into interstellar space a much richer gas uh, or a gas much richer in elements heavier than uh, helium. And so you get a third generation of stars, which form from the ashes of exploded giant second generation stars. And that would include stars like our star of the sun. Mm -hmm. It's a third generation star. It formed from the ashes right. of these uh, big second generation stars. And people always ask me, is there a fourth generation? I was just about to ask you that question. <laughs> well, the universe is only 13.8 billion years old, Fuzz. That's not enough time to get a significant fourth generation. And so in astronomy, we speak about three generations of stars. Population three, which is the first stars. Population two, which are the second generation. And our star, a population one. Mm -hmm. Say, so how come they got it reversed? Well, the population one stars are the easiest ones to detect. They're up close. So the ones astronomers discovered first, and then the two, and then the population three. Uh, but this poses a conundrum uh, for astronomers. If indeed these early galaxies, then by the way, uh, this paper got published in Nature Astronomy. I do appreciate the fact they said this is the first time these spectral measurements have been done. We've only done them on a few galaxies. Obviously, this needs to be confirmed because mm -hmm. it could be that they were observing outlier galaxies. Right. And so this needs to be studied in more depth. Uh, but reading the paper, they may be onto something that the first form galaxies indeed are producing uh, heavy elements at a less efficient process than what theoreticians had thought. And that actually gives us insight on the firstborn stars. Mm -hmm. yeah, depending on the population of the firstborn stars and uh, their mass distribution, you'll get a different uh, abundance of elements heavier than helium. So this in no way challenges Big Bang cosmology. What it does do is say this may be a means by which we can discover what exactly were the firstborn stars like? Mm. What is their mass distribution? What is their population? When did they form? How did they form? This is what the James Webb is all about. And they're saying, hey, rather than trying to image these firstborn stars, which James Webb is really not capable of doing, it's not that powerful. It can maybe image mm. a big cluster of right. firstborn stars. They're saying, here's another way to get the answer. Let's do these spectral measurements of galaxies, and that by itself will tell us uh, what is the nature of the firstborn star. So I love the idea right. that this is actually an easier and more effective way uh, to answer the question of the nature of the firstborn stars. But if indeed uh, what they discovered stands up with future observations, to me it makes the abundance of heavy elements we see in our solar system and especially on planet Earth, mm. all the more remarkable. Because that means we're actually starting off with a much more diluted mix mm. of elements heavier than helium than we thought, which means we're going to need more extraordinary fine tuning uh, to explain why our planet Earth mm. is so rich in elements heavier than helium. And we already got some insights. The fact that uh, we must have formed adjacent to two neutron stars emerge together to make a black hole. Because that's a very efficient way to make elements heavier mm -hmm. than iron. Uh, but we need to be looking elsewhere. If indeed this result stands up, it means maybe we haven't looked at all the sources uh, that explains why mm -hmm. we have such an extraordinarily rich abundance right. of heavy elements in the crust of the earth. And hey, it's gonna take a few years before we get those answers. But I think this is exciting news uh, for all of us who hold to the belief mm -hmm. uh, that God is the one uh, that designed and created and designed mm -hmm. our galaxy, our solar system, and our planet. It's just going to be fun to find out exactly how he did it. Yeah. Is there any concern that uh, maybe the, 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 the theoretical models for elemental production in st when stars burn is there any concern those models could be off or could be wrong? Uh, well, the nuclear synthesis models are, are quite well established. 
Uh, there's fine tuning that's going on there, but it's right. very minor adjustments that we're discovering. Uh, the answer to what is happening here is it will depend on what those first stars are like. Because stars at different masses mm -hmm. will produce these heavy elements at different rates. And so if you've got only a small population of these really big stars, that might explain the result we got here. Or if the mass distribution, mm -hmm. I mean, so if, this, if these first born stars are 500 to 1,000 times more massive than a star of the sun, they don't scatter their heavy elements in interstellar space as efficiently. Mm. A lot of that stuff winds up getting sucked into a black hole. It doesn't get distributed. And so these are the... I see. There, there's ways of explaining this result, but they're different ways. Uh, you know, black hole production uh, may be different than what we thought, or it could be that the distribution of stars and their masses is different than what we thought, or maybe in the early universe, we don't get quite as many of these firstborn high mass stars as we thought. These are all ways that mm -hmm. could explain it. And, and But bottom line is it's going to take more spectral work. Mm -hmm. We need to get more astrochemists involved in doing this research. Mm. You know, people like yourself, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Chemist, but not an astrochemist. So. Well, so astrobiologists, astrophysicists, so it's always astro something, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. <laughs> Everybody can get involved in astronomy. Yeah. Just because astronomy is so interdisciplinary. Yeah. Okay. You got any other comments? No, no, that's uh, interesting stuff. Um, yeah. You know, in, 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 uh, you know, it, it, there's just so much uh, discussion about the failure of the Big Bang based on James Webb that I continue to see, you know, online. It, well, this is really this helpful. Well, makes me fuzz because what James Webb is actually doing is giving us stronger evidence for the Big Bang model, not weaker evidence. Uh, what it is doing is challenging certain Big Bang models. But a lot of people, people aren't aware. We have dozens of Big Bang creation right. models. And the mission of James Webb is to determine which of those models right. actually describes the universe we observe. And it's not going to happen overnight. Again, we're looking at a decade right. to get the answers that the James Webb was specifically designed to determine. And notice we're also using the James Webb to look at how stars form nearby. Because yeah. that's actually going to give us some insight that we can apply to uh -huh. stars that are forming very far away than early in the universe. And hey, we're not just interested in what's happening in the early universe. We want to know what's happening in the entire 14 billion year history of the universe. Is star formation uh, different in ways we haven't anticipated throughout the history of the universe? This is what James Webb is going to help us. And yeah. by the way, it's not just going to be James Webb. I'm excited about that telescope that's heading to the same Lagrange 2 point as uh, James Webb. Mm. Uh, the Europeans are sending a big telescope to join the James Webb uh, at that Lagrange point. And that's a telescope that's going to be able to image millions of galaxies simultaneously and be able to give us insight on the cosmic web. James Webb is not able to do that, but this European Space Agency telescope mm. that's on its way to join the James Webb uh, is beautifully designed to give us insights mm on the, the cosmic web. That's where you get these bubbles near the universe, which where you get the galaxies and galaxy clusters distributed. It explains how dark matter mm -hmm. uh, plays a role in governing the distribution of galaxies. And we really need both telescopes. Both of them are gonna have a very different mission, but the, the, the two missions are definitely complementary. And the wonderful thing about the L2 site is that uh, it's immune to light pollution. Mm -hmm. But even the Hubble Space Telescope is suffering from light pollution. Why? Because of satellites. Yeah. There's tens of thousands of satellites orbiting the Earth. And people don't know this, but when you look at a Hubble Space Telescope image, they have to process the image and remove all the satellite tracks. Mm. And I've seen some raw Hubble Space Telescope images where the satellite tracks totally dominate the image. Mm -hmm. I think I showed them in one article that I wrote that's posted at reasons.org. With a James Webb Space Telescope and this European uh, telescope, they don't have to worry mm -hmm. uh, about their images being degraded uh, by satellite imagery. 
and they don't have to worry about having to shut down uh, when the satellite orbits and now the sun's a problem. Yeah. Uh, with a James Hubble Space Telescope, they can use it 23 hours a day. James Webb, you can use it 24 hours a day. How long does it take to, um, to deploy the satellite? Well, it takes... Well, you know, from the European Space Agency, has this been launched yet? Or? Oh, it's launched. It's on its way. Okay. And it's been on its way for more than a month. Okay. So, yeah, it takes a couple to three months to get there. And then once it's there, just like with James Webb, it took six full months after the launch date before it was operational. Because, yeah, it takes about three months to get there. Then once you're there, uh, you have to test it, uh, you know, basically unfurl everything make sure it's working. Uh, they do that with every telescope, by the way. Mm -hmm. They got what's called first light, uh, where they basically open up the telescope, and but then they're calibrating it, making sure all the instruments work. All that's got to be done, because the last thing you want is uh, to have an image being produced by a telescope and say, oh, there's an instrumental effect we didn't take into account. Right. And so there's always a several-month window uh, where they're basically carefully calibrating everything so they know when they actually start doing the real astronomy, they're getting uh, reliable material mm -hmm. uh, where the systematic effects are either, uh, you know, able to be removed easily and all well known. Yeah. 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 So how long does it take for the data to come back then from James Webb? Well, it's only a, a million miles away. Okay, so it's a fairly... It's a few seconds. Okay, okay. It's not yeah. a, a long delay then. You know, it's not like going to Mars. With Mars, you're looking at 20 minutes to get the data back. Yeah. But with James Webb, it's... Uh, well, you can work out the math. Yeah. It's probably, what, about uh, eight seconds? Okay. I don't know, less than that, six seconds to get yeah. the data back. Okay. So not a long wait. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's it's amazing when you think about, you know, what we've achieved as human beings in terms of our capacity to characterize the universe, you know, um, and the fact that the universe is intelligible, that's a whole nother topic for another day, but it's amazing, isn't well, it? Well, I'm impressed uh, because, you know, James Webb was expensive. The European space uh, mission is not that expensive because they learn from all, I mean, with James Webb, they're doing everything brand. We've never sent a telescope right. that far away from Earth. Never really had to work out how do we keep it stable? How do we make sure we don't have to do any repairs? Because it's far enough away you can't do repairs. Uh, but enough was learned from that that I think we're going to see several telescopes mm -hmm. being sent out to the L2 site. So, yeah, it may seem like a lot of taxpayer uh, money went down the drain, uh, but it's actually, right. it's kind of like when they do these, uh, you know, fighter aircraft. The first ones out are the most expensive yeah. ones, but then they're able to... Learn from all the engineering mistakes. That well, they made. I was talking once with somebody who uh, used to work for a pharmaceutical company, and he was telling me that the second pill off the assembly line costs three cents, but the first pill cost a, bil a billion dollars. <laughs> right. Yeah. So similar Same concept. principle, yeah. <laughs> so the second pill is a lot less. It's still fairly expensive, but instead of 10 billion, we're more like talking only a billion. Yeah. Only a billion. Yeah. <laughs> Well, this has been great, Buzz. I want to thank all of you for joining us today on Star Cells and God. Join the discussion in the comments below. And remember to like this video and to subscribe for more content. New episodes of Star Cells and God release each Wednesday and are available here on YouTube and on your, on your favorite podcast app. Be sure to share this video with a friend. And remember, the more we learn about science, the more reasons we have to believe in Jesus Christ as creator, Lord, and Savior. Thank you.